have been in a series the last few weeks called Running with the Giants. Running with the Giants. Really what this is, is we get this from uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 where it says, listen, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that so easily trips us up, especially the sin. And then it says, you know, it says, and so let us run this race with endurance. And so really we get this text, really uh, this, this series from this text of where we say, you know, we're surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses. Who are those witnesses? That's people that have gone before us, these great men and women in the Bible, these giants of the faith that have gone before us that are now cheering us on. And we're running a race. We're running a race with uh, with endurance. And our heart is, and God's heart is that we would finish the race strong. And so what really where we get this text is this concept is, listen, as we're running this race that we call life, if we're running laps, that we would kind of pull these giants of the faith out of the crowd and say, hey, why why don't you give me some advice about 2021? Why don't you give me some advice? If you were living in this time period, if you were living, if you could give us one thought, what would it be? And so we've been kind of breaking that down. Well, today I want to talk to you about a mighty woman in the Bible. Uh, and her name was Sarah, a.k.a. before that was Sarai. And I want to talk to you about the woman in the Bible named Sarah. She was ma- married to Abraham. And she was a mighty woman of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 11, it says this, And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She considered him faithful because he made the promise. Many of you know the story of Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, but they were over the age of childbearing. If you don't know, Abraham was 100 years old when he had, when he had Isaac. Sarah was 90 years old. I don't know about you, but could you imagine being a parent at 190? Come on, somebody. I'm about to turn 37, and I'm like, Jesus, help me. Come on, somebody. I can't imagine being 190. Come on. I mean, God, God showed up for sure. But he was faithful to the promise, even though limit of life, the, limits of phys- the physical limits of life said this is not possible. God said it's possible. And if there's one thing I believe that Sarah would say to us if we, were, if we said run a lap with us, I, I really believe she would say this, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. You may have someone that's far from God and you think, I have no idea, a family member, a friend, I have no idea how they would ever come back to God. Let me encourage you, with God, all things are possible. You may have a family member that's been sick in their body and and it doesn't look good. Let me encourage you, with God, all things are possible. You may be at a place in your life where you're saying, I don't know how I'm going to financially be able to do this or I don't know uh, how I'm going to be able to live and I don't know what the future holds. Let me encourage you, with God, all things are possible. I believe this. And actually in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26, Jesus said this. Look, he looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Not only do we believe that Sarah would say this, but Jesus said this. With God, all things are possible. Are possible. I want to show you in Genesis chapter 17, really the story of Abraham and, and, and Sarah. It says, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Uh, you, her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be a mother of many nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. God makes this promise to Abraham. And actually a few chapters before this, he makes the promise and he continues to reiterate the promise. He continues to tell Abraham, I've, I made a promise. And in fact, this is at first he's saying, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. In this scripture here, he actually says, I'm, he mentions Sarah. He says, I want you to know, I, we're changing Sarai's name to Sarah. Why? Because she's going to be a mother to many nations. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 9, it says, where is your wife, Sarah? Here's what happens. Uh, God shows up an angel of the Lord shows up uh, and, and is talking to Abraham. And he, he asks, where's your wife, Sarah? There, is, there in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And Sarah had, uh, pa- has pa- was past the age of childbearing. Verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself and she thought, after I am worn out, my God, she's calling herself worn out. Come on, ladies, you know what I'm saying? After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abram, why did Sarah and, why would Sarah laugh and say, will I have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard 
for the Lord. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. The angels of the Lord speak to Abraham, and, and Sarah's listening through the tent, and she hears Ab- this, this, the, the angel of the Lord say, Sarah's going to have a child. She laughs. She said, come on, <laughs> really? Like, come on, you see me? <laughs> yeah, right. And she says, there's no way. And immediately, here's, what, here's the, the cool thing is she was not laughing out loud hysterically where everyone could hear her. She was in a tent and she heard them and she laughed and God heard her. And he says, why did, why did Sarah laugh? Why was it? Is anything too hard for God? And here's what's cool. It shows us the picture of how God loves us so much that he hears our hearts. He hears our cries. He hears what, what, we're, what, we're, what we're saying. We could feel like he's so far. We could feel like he doesn't hear us, but yet he does. And he's saying this, listen, you may, you may say, it's too hard. I don't know how I'm going to do this, or I don't know how this is going to happen. And God says this, is anything too hard for the God that we serve? The God that I serve, the God that I believe in, there is nothing too difficult. There is absolutely nothing too difficult on this planet. Let me explain why I know this. Because if he can save me, I know he can, he can free me. If he can save me, he can heal me. If he, let me tell you something. The hardest thing is to forget. The hardest thing is to save my sin. Why? Because no one else can. And he did that. He did the impossible. He forgave me of my sin. And so now it shows me, it gives me confidence in knowing this. Nothing's too hard for the Lord that I serve. Nothing's too difficult. And here's what I know, and this is what I believe, that if we really say, okay, nothing's too difficult for the Lord, that he, he, here's what I know. We have to understand the concept of this, that he's, he's given us promises. If he's given us promises, then we know this, they will come to pass. It's important that as we walk through the process, okay, because we could just say, oh, yeah, nothing's impossible with God. Oh, yeah, nothing's impossible with God. Oh, yeah, God can do the impossible. But here's the practical application. What does that look like for us? It looks like this. If we really believe that, then we must know his promises. We must really know what God says. What does God say in the season of life that I'm in? What are his promises for me today? What is the, are his promises for my family today? What does he say? We must know the promises. Do you know that in the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises that God gives to humanity? Over 7,000 promises God gives humanity. Why? Because he wants us to know this. He's a God that never changes. He's a God that stands on his word. That are, that are, that are 7,000 things that we know that we can stand on in faith and say, God's gonna do it. We have to know his promises. It's so important. Here's why I say that. Let me show it to you. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 4, we're talking about Sarah today. It says, Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Abraham, this is in in Genesis chapter 15. God says, I'm going to give you your son. Abraham complains to God, says, You've not given me a son. He says, You've not given me a child. You've not given my own heir. Is a servant going to be one that ends up taking my, 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 my legacy? And God says, No. No, I'm going to give you your own son to be your heir. Well, here's what's interesting. God gives this promise to Abraham, which obviously means Sarah is a part of that promise. But here's what's interesting. He did not tell Sarah this. He told Abraham this. Now watch one chapter later what Sarah does because God gave Abraham the promise and Abraham did the promise, but Sarah did not. It says, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, or she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Sarah, he, God knew what he was doing. And what happens is he says to Abraham, I want you to know, I've given you this promise. Abraham knows the promise. Abraham goes and shares this promise with with Sarai. But Sarai did not hear from God for herself. And so here's what she says. She says, the Lord has kept me from having children. She didn't know God's promises for herself. Why? Because she did not hear God's promises for herself. What she had done was heard of God's promises from someone else. Let me tell you something. What you hear on a Sunday is not what will sustain you during the week. It has to be God's promises for you. If not, here's what happens. We end up making mistakes because somebody said it, but he's not doing it for me. Maybe that's for someone else. 
But here's what's cool. God meant for the promise to be about for him and Sarai, but Sarai didn't know the promise for herself. It's so important as Christians, as believers, especially in the day and the age that we are living in, that we know his promises. Why? Because they are the things that we stand on day in and day out for our lives. What are his promises? I, I, I wrote a list of 50 different promises. You probably won't be able to see it if you're in the back, praise God. <laughs> and that's just 50 of them. And I got scriptures for you and references for you. If you want those later, tell us. We'll email them to you. But I mean, it's all different things. God will bring life to you in the dead places. God was giving you strength and you're blessed and, and you're dead, dead to sin, alive to God. God sanctifies you. Your sin is covered. God's your rock. God delights in you and, all, and so on and so on. I can go all day. And that's only 50 of them. There are 7,000. And here's what's cool about God's promises. God's promises come to pass. We just have to stand on them. Now, here's what I know. We can't stand on them if we don't know them. Sarai should have stood on his promise. God's going to make me a mother. I don't care how old I am. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what I feel. God said it. It's going to come to pass. But she didn't hear it for herself. And here's what happens. She ended up giving in to her feelings and, her, and, and the thought processes. And it caused her to make the mistake that she made. We have to know his promises. It's so valuable and important that we know. Why do we have to know his promises? I think this is so important. It, it, here's what I, it's oftentimes we think of. We think of reading the scripture, studying the scripture, knowing the scripture, knowing his word. We can sometimes feel like it's a duty. We have to. It's part of, what, it, it's part of, the, it's part of the obligation of being a Christian. No. God's promises are not for God. God didn't give us promises to be like, okay, now, let me, let, this is for me. Now go and do. No, God gave us promises for us to do two things, to lift us and to protect us. When we're down, his promises are meant to lift us, to build us up, to encourage us, to strengthen us. They're meant to, we, when, we, when we're, we're walking through something that well, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm caught up in my sin. No, the Bible says I'm dead to my sin. I'm alive in him. He, it's, it's meant to lift us up. God's promises, here's, here, here, here's, here's what's, what's, what's cool. Knowing God's promises doesn't make God approve of us any more or any less. God doesn't say, oh, you know four promises. <laughs> oh, you know seven promises. You. You are. Uh, uh, uh. I need a moment. That's not what God does with his promises. God gives us his promises, not because so, so we can know them, so we get his approval. No, they're not for us to get better approval from God. He loves us where we are. That's why he gave us the promises. He gave us the promises when we were yet still in our sin. Not once we got out of our sin. We have to know the promises because when we're in the sin, we can know I can get out of the sin through him. His promises were meant to lift us. It's like this basketball. Where's that basketball? Who's got the basketball? It's like this basketball. I got an analogy for you. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for the... I can catch, dude. Thanks. <laughs> He's not going to come hand it to me. Okay, cool, man. <laughs> it's like this basketball. This basketball, let's say this is the promises of God. Now, look, when we, here's what I want to show you. Like when we, This is what it does. His promises, the ball bounces, it goes up. Okay? Just go with me. Okay? Law of gravity, obviously, it, we, we know it's going to come up. To do that. Okay, we know that. Okay, as the ball goes up, this is what, what's cool. This is like God's promises. God's promises are moving. God's promises are going to happen. This ball, we know, if I bounce it, it's coming up. It's going, no, no matter what I do, the ball's coming up, okay? It's like God's promises. We know God's promises will come to pass. They're going up. Now, here's what's cool. If I attach myself to this ball, my hand goes up. Watch. My hand goes up, okay? And here's what the ball, the force of the ball will make my hand go up if I let my hand. Now, here's what's cool. It's the same thing with our faith. When we attach our faith to his promises, we then get lifted up to where God's taking us. But here's what happens. I have to put my hand on the ball in order for the ball to move my hand. Okay, if my hand's here, my hand's not going anywhere. I have to attach my faith to his promises to allow them to lift me. His promises will never lift us if we don't attach our faith to them. 
It's so important as Christians, we understand this. Attaching our faith. Okay, I know my mom's been sick. Okay, I know my family member's far from God. Okay, I know. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I know this. But I know God said it. So if God said it, I'm going to attach myself. I'm going to know that word. I'm going to attach myself to the word. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to let God take me to where he's called me to be. It's his promises. And then it's meant to protect us. His, his promises are meant so that we can use them as a weapon against the enemy in our lives. There are so many lies of the enemy trying to attack every generation in our culture. There are so many lies to the point of where now most people don't know the, what the truth and what the truth is or isn't. We have to know the promises. Why? So that we can understand God wants us to use these to fight the enemy off of our own mind and our own lives. His promises are meant to be to lift us and to protect us. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Then the Lord said to him, Now you know you servant, know your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Genesis chapter 15, verse 4, right here in this scripture. This is what this is Abraham 75 years old. He's 75 years old, and God makes the promise to him, you will have a son. Genesis chapter 21. Six, six chapters later, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, and he said, he had said, and the Lord, as, as he had said, excuse me, then the Lord did for Sarah what he promised. He gave her a son, and she named him Isaac. Here's, here's what it is. Genesis chapter 15, Abraham was 75 years old. Genesis chapter 21, if you keep reading on here right here, Abraham was 100 years old. 25 years they waited God's promises take patience. God's promises take patience. 25 years they waited. Some of us don't like to wait 25 minutes. Just me? Cool, I'll go pray afterwards. For 25 years they waited for God to, to do what he said. And here's what we do when we hear God or we feel like God's speaking to us and it doesn't happen in a week or two weeks or three weeks. We're like, God, what in the world are you doing? I thought you promised me. What are you doing? No, no, no. We're taking the culture of impatience and we're bringing it into Christianity. I will tell you this. Part of the kingdom process is patience. I'll, I'll go a step further. A major part of the kingdom process is patience. A major part. You can think of all these great men and women in the Bible who God made wait. Do you know Noah? He spoke to Noah in the Bible uh, about building an ark. Do you know that he built that ark and waited for rain for a hundred years? A hundred years. He heard God and a hundred years later, here comes some rain. Praise God. A hundred years. Most of us, except for me, because I know God's going to keep me going. I'm not going to make it to a hundred years. I probably won't either the way I eat, praise God. <laughs> Need to get rid of some of the donuts. A <laughs> hundred years, they waited. You look at David, he was a teenager. And he, didn't, and he, was, he was told and promised to be, he was going to be king. He wasn't king until he was 30 years old. We see all throughout the scripture, these great men and these great women are patiently waiting for God to do what he said. And then we come into our culture and our time period and we think God's gonna do something different. God is a God that wants us to live a life of patience. Why? Because I really do believe this. When, we, when we're patient, it's really the ultimate uh, really uh, example or lifestyle of trust and faith. It's saying no matter what I feel, I'm going to trust what God is saying, even if it takes 25 years. Why? Because I know if he said it, it's going to happen. It takes patience in our lives. It's so important. We are in such an impatient culture. I call our culture the, the, the microwave culture. We can get anything in two minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, we want it, I can do it. You know what I'm saying? They make everything right now. You can do shipping right now. They got a shipping company coming here so we can get shipping closer. Come on, somebody. Okay. 25 years. Patience is this. Patience is when I, I allow my faith to be louder than my feelings. I allow my faith to be louder than my feelings. Oftentimes, our feelings are so loud, we hear nothing but that. 
And that is the opposite. That is, that is I would say, anti-kingdom, if you will. That is the counter-cultural of what God is wanting to do, counter-kingdom counter culture of what God is trying to do. God wants us to quiet our feelings and put our faith and let our faith, let our faith live louder. And here's what happens. When I have faith, it allows me to be patient. Why? Because I can trust and fully lean on him. Sarah, we see in the scripture, she didn't do this. She got caught up in her feelings. And because she got caught up in her feelings, she made a mistake when she should have been at the place of where she says, no, I'm going to let my faith in God and what he said really be the one and the thing that leads me. Uh, here's what I do. How do we really have patience in, in, as we trust God? Psalms chapter 46 and verse 10, it says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. How do we really live a life of patience? with the Lord in the kingdom. It's two things. It's wait on, be still, wait on God. Wait, patience, stop, be still, stop moving. You know, if you're like me, you like to move a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like I was quarantined, I thought, I thought it was over. I thought, my, I thought it was it. I thought life was, I mean, it was terrible. Okay, be still. Don't get caught up in all the thought processes. Don't get caught up in the what ifs. Don't get caught up in the, in the, in the situation. Be still. Wait on the Lord. And then I love it. It doesn't just say be still and it stops. It says be still and know that I am God. See, be still is this concept of, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to try to do this. I'm going to give control to God. I'm going to take control out of my own hands. I'm going to give control to God. I'm going to be still. But then I'm going to wait. Then I'm waiting on God. Then what I'm doing is I'm going to take a step further, and then I'm going to know that I am God, know that he is God. I'm being still, but as I'm being still, I'm not just sitting still doing nothing. Now I'm knowing that he's God. I'm spending time with him. I'm building relationship with him. I'm worshiping him. I'm praying to him. I'm knowing that he's God. I can't just say I know God I want to really know God for myself here's what I know waiting on God awaiting uh, period impatiently it, it, here's what happens our minds wander our minds start to think a million different things if we sit still too long our minds just go 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 and here's what happens that's what happens when we wait on God okay what if he doesn't what if he does what if he does what is it when huh and we're getting all caught up but here's what happens. But see, it's not just be still. It's also know that I am God. So here's what happens. When I start to pray and I start to worship, here's what it does. It honors God, but then it doesn't just honor God. It quiets me. It quiets my mind. It, quiets, it makes my problem go from real big to my problem real small and my God real big. It, 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 it keeps me still from being still, waiting on him. But then I go a step further and now I say, now, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to honor you. Why? Because as I do that, God, you quiet those things in my brain so that I can continue to trust you the way that I'm called to trust you. It's patience, you wait on. Then it's two thing, things. Patience is waiting on and then waiting for. Waiting on and then waiting for. Actually, I said those backwards. First, it's waiting for and then wait for God. Then it's waiting on. It's serving God. You ever been to a restaurant you've been waited on? It's the same thing. Our hearts should be that we should be people that are desiring to be servants of the kingdom, that we would serve God. What does that look like? It's giving my life to him, living a life obedience to him, and then not just serving him, and it's part of serving him, but also serving others. I can get so caught up in all the things I want God to do, what I need to do, what I'm waiting, when I should be spending that energy on serving those around me. His promises, I'm telling you, are so important, and his promises are so good for us, but it takes us to take, it makes, it's a, important for us to take a moment and say, I'm going to be patient and wait. Why? Because when I do, I know God's going to show up in his timing, not my timing. In his timing, not my timing. I don't know what you're waiting on. Everybody in this room is probably waiting for something. We're waiting on something for the Lord. Be patient. Trust God. Wait for God, but then also wait on God and watch God begin to work in your life in his timing when he's called, when he desires to do so. Genesis chapter 16 and verse 1 says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. Here's what I know about his promises, that I know that it, with God all things are possible, and his promises will always come true. We have to know his promises. We have to understand we need patience to receive his promises. But then also we have to know that his promises go beyond our weakness. His promises go beyond our weakness. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. Sarai, Sarai or Sarah did the unimaginable. She went completely against what God wanted her to do and what God said to do. And here's what's cool. God still gave her a son. 
God still allowed her to receive his promise, even though she made a major mistake. My mistakes, your mistakes, do not void his promises. Now, mistakes have consequences. Anybody that preaches that, anyone that doesn't preach that, you don't want to go to their church. Come on, somebody. Mistakes have consequences, but it doesn't void his promises. Let me show it to you in Psalms chapter 119 and verse 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. His word, his promises are eternal. That means from now until eternity, his promises remain true. His promises will come to pass. I'm not good enough, strong enough, bad enough, not good enough, whatever you want to call it, to void his promises. Why? Because his promises are eternal. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11. If you don't believe me, I'll tell you, give you one more. So shall my word be the what goes out from your my mouth. This is God talking. He says, shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. My word, my promises will not return to me void. Sarah, Sarah, whoever, whatever you want to call her, she did not void the promise of God in her life. Oftentimes, we can get to the place in our lives as Christians, as believers, where we can think, oh, did I make too many mistakes, and now I missed it. Oh, did I make too many mistakes, and now I'm not going to get, oh, well, I, if I don't date this person, like, God may not give me another one. No, no, no. Here's what it is. His promises will not return void. We just have to know we can trust him. And so even in my weakness, he is still good, and he's still God. You ever been to the circus? You're like, yeah, I'm at one right now. <laughs> that just came to me right there. That wasn't planned. You ever been to the circus and they, they got these guys and these girls that they walk these tight ropes? I think they play you a little bit. Like, I think like they're not really that unbalanced and they're like, whoa. And you're like, ah! And no, okay, good, good, good. Ash and I went to the circus one time, and this guy, he's walking over us. I'm like, man, if that dude falls on me, I'm dead. <laughs> and they're walking this tightrope, and I, 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 I don't get real nervous very often, but I get so nervous when somebody's in danger. So, like, the person's, like, walking, and I'm like, ah, 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 uh, just, just move, please, move. And then, like, they stop in the middle, and they, like, turn. And you know, oftentimes, we as Christians can think this is what Christianity is about. It's walking this tightrope. Oh, I got, I got to make sure that I, I read my Bible, and I got to make sure that I don't, oh, I got, oh, oh, oh. And, and what happens is we think, oh, if I don't, if I don't, then I'm not going to get to his promises, and then I'm not going to get the spouse that I want, or I'm not going to get the job, or I'm not going to, and, and, and here's what it is. And let, this right here is nerve-wracking. Christianity, oh, I'm going to get excited for a second. Christianity was never meant to be nerve-wracking. Christianity was meant to be a joy. The Bible says, for the joy of the Lord is my Praise God. It's not supposed to be this, oh, 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 if I miss it and I fail, if I fall. Uh, no, here's what it is. God says, walk with me. As you walk with me, even in your weakness. I am strong. I am good. My promises are true. Walk with me in relationship with me. That doesn't mean we just go off and do whatever we want, but I don't have to do this. Uh, 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 uh. No, it's I serve him. I walk with him. I follow him. As I follow him, he begins to speak to me. I begin to follow him more. And here's what happens. He begins to bring his promises to fulfillment. Why? Not because I'm walking a tightrope. That means his promises are on me. His promises are not on me. His promises are on him. And so I don't have to do this. I do this, me and Jesus. And here's what happens. God shows up and he blesses us and takes care of us and provides for us wherever it is that we need. Talking too fast? I know. Here's what I know. His promises are eternal. There's nothing you and I could do to avoid his word. And so now, here's what happens. When I know that, it's freeing for me. So now I don't have to walk on a tightrope. Oh, man, I hope I, hope I do. I hope I don't. Oh, now it's just I walk, and I go. Oh. The Bible says that Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, and I'll give you rest. 
That doesn't sound like being nerve-wracking. That doesn't sound like this lifestyle of this anxiety of thinking, oh my gosh, am I doing good enough? Am I not doing good enough? Am I, am I reading my Bible enough in order to do this and get this? And am I going to church? No, it's I walk with him and my desire is to be with him. And then from there, God begins to allow us to see his promises come to pass. His promises, they're so good. And here's what I love about his promises. If you read them, most of them are situations or, or things that you say that you seem that seem impossible. But as we see in this scripture with Sarah, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. All we have to do is trust him and know if he said it, he'll do it. If he said it, it will happen. It will come to pass. We, here's what we do. We know his promises. Here's what we do. We wait patiently on him. Here's what we do. Now we, was we walk with him, not nerve-wracking, thinking, oh, if I make a mistake, I'm done. No, I walk with him in this relationship, and it's a joy. It's a privilege. It's not this, this obligation. It's not this heaviness. No, it's I get to walk with him. And here's what, I, as, here's what happens. As I walk with him, God begins to take care of me, and I begin to see his promises come to pass. His promises will always come to pass. His word never changes. He never goes back on his word. If, if he said it, it will happen. We serve a God. That I'm, let me encourage you. We serve a God. I'm closing. We serve a God where we know all things are possible. I don't know what it is you're believing for. I don't know what it is you're, th you're thinking about. I don't know what it is that weighs heavy on you. I don't know. Here's what I do know. I believe God wanted this message to be spoken because he wants you to know it's possible. He wants you to just grab on, let, let your faith be lifted and know he can do it. Oh, it's been so long. Doesn't matter. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to latch on with my faith to his promises. I'm going to know those scriptures. I'm going to read those scriptures. I'm going to study those scriptures. Maybe you're like going through something. You don't know where the promise is. Just Google so-and-so promise about so-and-so. Many scriptures will come up and allow your faith to be built on those scriptures. Why? Attach your words to the scriptures. Speak those scriptures. Write those scriptures. Memorize those scriptures. And here's what happens. As your faith attaches to that, here's what happens. God takes you to the promise that he's called you to. If God said it, it'll happen. With God, all things are possible. Amen? Can we pray today, Father? I thank you so much.